Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The opening of the legal year 2022 ceremony will now commence. We request those attending in person at the Supreme Court Auditorium to please rise. Please remain standing for the national anthem. For safe management reasons, there is no need to sing the national anthem. Please be seated. All manner of persons having anything to do with the sting of the court, draw near and give your attendance. Mr. Attorney. May it please your honours, Chief Justice, Justices of the Court of Appeal, Judges of the Appellate Division, Judges and Judicial Commissioners. We've been learning to cope and live with COVID-19 over the past year. Just as we thought we may have turned the page on the pandemic, the emergence of the new variant, Omicron, has reminded us of how unpredictable this crisis is. Throughout the uncertainty, the Attorney General's Chambers, or AGC, has stayed the course. We continue to provide critical legal support to the government as it responded to the various challenges brought on by COVID-19. We have not allowed the pandemic to slow us down. Even in the midst of crisis, we embarked on new initiatives to improve the way we work and to do things more effectively and, and efficiently. I'm very proud of the work done by my chambers over the past year despite the pandemic, which I will share with you later on in my speech. For now, I would like to shift gears away from COVID-19 and focus on the changes to the legal service that will come into effect on 14 January 2022, this Friday. This is a historic moment in the evolution of the legal service, which was established in 1959. I will begin with my thoughts about the reconstituted legal service and how this move will allow, will allow us to better prepare the legal service for the future. I would like to first express my gratitude to past and present presidents and members of the legal service, 
in particular to Chief Justice Mandon, who I have had the privilege and pleasure of working with on the Legal Service Commission these past years. I thank all these persons for shepherding the legal service to what it is today, a strong, well-respected, and highly professional institution that upholds the rule of law, serves the public, and safeguards the interests of Singapore. These past presidents and members helped lay the strongest of foundations for the legal service and provided clear guidance for its mission. The spirit of commitment to the rule of law and to public service that they instilled from the outset continues to run through all legal service officers or LSOs today. Since taking office, it has been a real privilege for me to have worked alongside such a team of dedicated, professional and capable lawyers who are united in their goal to serve the public interests. Further, I cannot understate the quality of the legal talent which we have in the legal service. We have to ensure that this precious pool of talent is nurtured, developed, and well taken care of. At this juncture, it may be useful to revisit the context and impetus for the restructuring of the legal services. The integrated model of the legal service comprising both the legal and judicial branches, has been in place since Singapore's independence. However, the question of whether the judicial scheme of service should be kept distinct from other parts of the legal service had been considered even before that. In the interim report of the Malayanization Commission, it advised that there should be a scheme allowing officers to transfer between the legal and judicial branches. The primary concern then was to give officers a more rounded experience and training. The importance of broad training for the professional development of LSOs continues to be relevant today, but the practice of law has changed dramatically since Singapore's independence. Matters have grown increasingly complex requiring not just breadth of legal knowledge, but also depth that can only come about with greater specialization. Criminal act activities, for example, have become increasingly sophisticated. Take cyber crimes and large-scale money laundering. Legislation has grown exponentially in volume, length, and complexity. Singapore's international obligations have become increasingly prominent in the government's considerations, and the role of a legal advisor has evolved. We've had, had to sharpen our legal skills and expertise to perform the role of problem solver, someone who is capable of identifying not just legal, but also practical solutions that are fit for purpose. Legal skills remain fundamental, but we are also increasingly need domain knowledge in emerging, in emerging areas and other fields, such as climate change, blockchain, and agile application development. Moreover, the legal service has grown to a size where the benefits of specialization now outweigh its trade-offs. In the past, one of the main reasons for a fused legal service was the need to preserve flexibility to deploy the limited number of LSOs to fulfill roles in accordance with the fluctuating needs of the legal and judicial branches. That need has gradually diminished with the increase in LSOs from just 45 LSOs at the time of Singapore's independence to more than 800 LSOs today. The pool of talent is now sufficiently large such that specialization can be more fully supported without sacrificing the efficient running of either branch of the legal service. It was for these reasons that separate legal and judicial tracts were introduced by Chief Justice Mannon in 2014. The restructuring of the legal service can therefore be seen as a natural progression that comes with maturity and growth. 
Parliament has assessed that this is the right time for the legal service to transition into the next phase and to embrace specialization to an even greater degree. As the Attorney General and President of the Reconstituted Legal Service, I welcome this shift and look forward to taking the legal service to the next level. Notwithstanding the restructuring, the core function of the legal service will remain the same. The legal service will continue to be a key pillar of the rule of law. We will continue to discharge our functions without fear of favour. We will continue to provide the highest quality legal support to the government be it in the areas of legislation drafting, providing legal advice and representation, making legal policy, enforcing laws, performing regulatory functions, or representing Singapore's interests on the international stage. We will build on these strong foundations that have made the legal service the premier service that it is today. The reconstituted legal service will comprise some 400 officers in the Attorney General's chambers and a further 200 officers deployed in ministries and statutory boards. This easily makes the legal service the biggest and a quote, law firm in Singapore. My vision for AGC has always been for it to, the, to be the best law firm in Singapore because the government and the country deserve nothing less. The government, the government must expect to receive from AGC legal advice or representation, which is at least equal in quality to what the top law firms in the private sector can provide. This vision will now extend to the reconstituted legal service and is grounded on what I term as the three Qs, namely quality people doing quality work, supported by quality systems and processes. So the goal now is to build a vibrant and agile legal service that will be prepared to meet the challenges of the future. This will require us to pivot even more towards specialization than before to respond to the increasing scope and complexity of legal work. Allowing LSOs to deepen expertise in key areas of legal practice is not new to my chambers. The shift to develop niche areas of practice had already started more than a decade ago with the establishment of what was then the Economic Crimes and Governance Division in AGC in 2011. We continued to move in a direction outside of criminal law with the establishment of specialist tracks in litigation, international law, and legislative drafting in 2020. We will continue to build depth of expertise to future-proof the reconstituted legal service to meet the evolving needs of the government. I can share two areas for specialization, which we have already identified, that will cut across the reconstituted legal service. First, we will be establishing a corporate law cluster to respond to a growing demand for legal support within the government in the area of corporate law. For example, the government had, in 2019, announced that it would provide a guarantee for Changi East borrowings, that's Changi Airport East borrowings, so as to lower the cost of borrowings. And just last year, the Significant Infrastructure Government Loan Act 2020 was passed. This act allows the government to borrow for certain significant infrastructure projects so as to promote intergenerational equity. As public financing policy in Singapore continues to evolve to meet the opportunities and challenges of the day, there is a need to develop a pool of LSOs who are proficient and competent to advise the government in areas that are currently undertaken by corporate entities, such as fundraisings, borrowings, provision of guarantees. Second, we have revamped the technology law cluster to better address the governments in Singapore's fast-evolving technological law needs. The technology law cluster will build up a pool of technology lawyers 
with specialist legal skill sets and technology know-how who can bridge law, technology, and policy. This will be done through targeted postings to government agencies and a structured and rigorous training program. These LSOs will be deployed throughout the public service and will deal with cutting-edge legal and regulatory issues that the law has had to grapple with in recent times. For example, the Court of Appeal had to consider in the case of B2C2 how the well-established contractual doctrine of mystic applied to algorithmic trading in cryptocurrencies. This entailed novel considerations of how the element of knowledge is addressed where a contract is formed without direct human intervention and where the cryptocurrency may be regarded as property in law. More recently, my chambers has intervened in a matter that is to be heard by the Court of Appeal next month concerning the handling of personal data and the underlying privacy concerns which the age of big data has brought about. These cases are just examples of how developments in the law, like much of our lives, have been shaped by technology advances and how the practice of law in the legal service is not immune to the digital headwinds that have impacted other legal practitioners. These clusters, these specialist clusters, mark the direction that the legal service will take in the future. LSOs from across the reconstituted legal service coming together to form a community of practitioners and sharing each other's experience and expertise. They will be given the requisite training to build up the legal skill sets and know-how in specific areas of law. We will continue to work with ministries to identify new areas of focus early to meet the government's critical legal needs, both present and future. With two-thirds of the reconstituted legal service comprising of AGC officers, the Attorney General's chambers will become the hub in bringing together the community of public lawyers to take the legal service to greater heights. AGC will provide the anchor to identify synergies and foster collaboration across AGC ministries and statutory boards. This will be done by leveraging on the resources of AGC, as well as the processes that AGC has put in place this year. <coughs> For example, the AGC Academy, which was set up to focus on meeting the training and development needs of AGC's officers, has been renamed the AGC Legal Service Academy. <coughs> Excuse me. And it will have, have a widened mandate. The AGC Legal Service Academy's new mission is to serve the wider community of public lawyers in the reconstituted legal service and not just AGC. This will ensure that all legal, office, all legal service officers continue to learn and develop the knowledge and skill sets throughout their career. The extension of the AGC Legal Service Academy's function is timely, as LSOs and ministries and statutory boards will need to be supported to keep up with the demands of their work, which has grown in tandem with the growing complexity of public governance. LSOs and the ministries and statutory boards will be given access to the same training and legal resources that are available to AGC officers. Training opportunities will also provide an additional avenue for the public community, for the community of public lawyers under the reconstituted legal service to come together to learn from one another, to exchange, to exchange views on cross-cutting legal issues, and to share legal knowledge and resources. The newly minted AGC Legal Service Academy will play a major part in all of this as it embarks on its role to support the wider community of public lawyers. Beyond training and specialization, the legal service will need to ensure that it is not only able to, to recruit the best legal minds into the service, but also retain talent within the service in order for it to continue to flourish. After all, the legal service is only as good 
as his people. The strength and appeal of the legal service will continue to be the sheer diversity of roles that it offers to lawyers who want to make a difference. These lawyers can serve the public interest <clears throat> either in AGC, as DPPs in the Criminal Division, as international lawyers in this International Affairs Division, as drafters in the Legislation Division, or as legal advisors and litigators in the Civil Division. Or, or these lawyers can serve in legal, policy, or regulatory roles in the ministries and statutory boards. All of these opportunities will continue to be available to officers in the legal service, in particular the junior lawyers, who may be interested in enjoying the full breadth of legal practice before deciding on the area of expertise. At the same time, we will continue to reap the benefits the cross-service exposure can bring for legal and, ju and judicial officers alike. This will be achieved by way of targeted secondments. The legal and judicial service commissions <coughs> will work out a suitable framework to ensure that secondments will be a rich and fulfilling experience. For officers who have found their calling in the other services, permanent transfers between the services will also be available, will also be possible, subject to broader considerations which will be defined or refined. To attract and retain talent, we must offer the best opportunities for legal service officers to develop meaningful and deeply rewarding careers as public lawyers. At its core, it is about ensuring that the reconstituted legal service remains the place where LSOs feel they can use their legal skills to make a difference. We will ensure that the legal service continues to be a place where LSOs feel proud they can, that they can play a direct role in serving the public interest and see to it that laws are made, implemented and, un, and enforced fairly and efficiently. I am also conscious that we will need to continue to ensure that our policies and benefits remain competitive and reflect the standing of the legal service as a premier service. We will be reviewing our human resources policies to ensure that the legal service remains the employer of choice for the brightest talents in the legal profession. <clears throat> Let me now turn to what my chambers has achieved over the past year it would be remiss of me not to highlight, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> something in my throat is not COVID, don't worry. It would be remiss of me not to highlight the hard work my officers have continued to put in, overcoming pandemic fatigue that has in inevitably set in to a lot of people. In my speech for the opening of the legal year 2021, I spoke about how AGC had to deal with the unprecedented challenge of providing critical legal support in the face of the evolving public health threat posed by COVID-19. This challenge is manifested in both scale and intensity. Not only did AGC's workload increase substantially, but a significant larger proportion of the work was urgent and had to be completed within tight timelines. Thankfully, 2021 has been less tumultuous, even if it has not felt like it at times. That is not to say that it has been an easy year by any means. Just as the nation has moved towards living with COVID-19, AGC has adopted to our new normal. For my officers at AGC, living with COVID-19 has meant continuing to provide urgent and cross-cutting COVID-related advice on all aspects of the pandemic response and ensuring that those who have breached COVID-19 regulations are dealt with swiftly and firmly. <clears throat> As the COVID-19 situation continued to evolve and the nation transitioned from a COVID-0 approach to an endemic situation, the measures required to keep the population safe while balancing other needs also had to be adapted. 
from the tightening of border control measures when Singapore was put on heightened alert to the introduction of vaccinated, differentiated, safe management measures, AGC was actively involved in providing the, the legal assistance required in shaping the government's policy as we moved towards a COVID-resilient nation. If you have learned any lessons from the past two years, it is that change is the only constant. AGC has continued to stand steadfast through these turbulent times by staying nimble, so as to support urgent policy formulation and strict enforcement action. What served us well last year was not just the domain expertise that we had acquired during the earlier days of our fight against COVID-19, but also the relationships and processes we had established with our stakeholders. These have enabled, have enabled us to provide quick and targeted legal advice, even at, at the nascent stages of policy, of policy formulation, <clears throat> which in turn allowed government agencies to react rapidly to the constant changes. With these foundations in place, we're ready to address the twists and turns that may arise should new COVID-19 variants emerge. While COVID-19 remained a significant area of focus for my chambers, we did not take our eye off other duties and functions, pushing ahead with initiatives to improve the way we operate. We have continued to improve how we deal with existing streams of work beyond COVID-19. Two examples, both related to criminal prosecution, demonstrate the importance we place on ensuring that justice is not only done, but done expediently. We recognize the prejudice that delays in prosecution could cause to both victims and accused persons alike, and have taken active steps to expedite the investigative and decision-making processes. First, since 1st July 2021, my chambers has deployed around 30 DPPs under the Office of the Public Prosecution, or we call it the OPP initiative, to the police divisions. These DPPs who are embedded at police divisions have assisted with the early review of investigation papers, or IPs, and formulating replies to the representations of accused persons. Early feedback has been positive. The dedicated involvement of DPPs at the upstream stage of the charging process has allowed IPs to be cleared quicker and more efficiently. We have increased the number of IP-related requests processed by approximately 30% in the last year, despite the OPP scheme being in fact only for the later part of the year. The police divisions have also appreciated the greater ease of, of access to legal advice and improved channels of communications with my chambers. With these positive results, we will explore how to further enhance and deepen the benefits gained from this OPP initiative. Second, in order to promote timely and consistent decision-making in the prosecutorial process, we have introduced a follow-through scheme of assignment for all cases within AGC from 1 July 2021. The same DPP will now oversee a case from the pre-trial stage all the way to its conclusion. This streamlining of criminal case management assignments allows the DPP to be intimately familiar with the development of a prosecutorial matter. Apart from contributing to the professional development of DPPs as they oversee the case from start to end, it also allows the law enforcement partners and members of the criminal bar to know which DPP to contact on the case if necessary. We have also continued to engage in constructive dialogue with the criminal bar, which is an essential cog in the wheels of criminal justice. Aside from our regular dialogue sessions, we have worked with members of the criminal bar to develop a remodeled AGC portal for the submission of representations on behalf of accused persons. This automates what currently remains a very manual process and ensures that representations are dealt with in a timely manner 
by routing them to the relevant, relevant DPPs as quickly as possible. The portal is already currently is currently in the final phase. Uh, sorry, its portal is currently in the pilot phase, <clears throat> and is already available to members of the criminal bar for the making of representations. We aim to have all members of the criminal bar make representations on the portal by the middle of the year. Another group that we will be engaging and working more closely with this year are the prosecutors in the ministries and agencies. We would like to better understand their needs on the ground and to explore how we can support them to meet the growing demands and increasing complexities that they face in their prosecution work. As a start, we will provide them with training and share our legal resources with them. We will also institute short-term secondments of DPPs to these prosecution units to better support their requirements. We are prepared to consider longer-term postings for DPPs to head prosecution units should it be required. Finally, I'm pleased to announce that the 2020 revised edition of Acts has come into force on 31st December 2021. The last revision of Acts was in 1985, more than 35 years ago. The 2020 revised edition of Acts aims to produce a verified consolidation of all in four statutes as amended up to 1st December 2021. You will see the use of plain English and shorter sentences in the 2020 revised edition of Acts. This is a significant step in our drive to ensure that our legislation will be effective, readable, and more understandable to members of the public and not just to judges and lawyers. But we are doing so without changing the meaning of this legislation. It is a culmination of more than four years of hard work by the Law Revision Commissioners with the able support of AGC's Legislation Division. It is a mammoth task, and I just cannot begin to, to tell you the number of men hours that was exp expended on, on this revision. It is a task that, frankly, I would not wish on anyone. The scope of the 2020 revised revi edition of Acts comprised 510 Acts and approximately 27,000 pages. This far exceeded the scope of the 1985 revised edition of Acts that comprised 387 Acts and approximately only 8,000 pages. Some of the key features of the revision include the removal of chapter numbers for Acts with the short title of the Act now containing the year of enactment. It also includes the use of gender-neutral language and the replacement of certain expressions, such as the word shell with, with must. For practitioners, academics, and law students who are accustomed to citing chapter numbers for acts, like myself, there will no doubt be some adjustment when referring to the revised acts. But on the whole, I think most of us can agree that the revision of laws is a change for the better say perhaps for the few who have, found, who have fond memories of intense debate over whether the word shall in an act is permissive or mandatory in nature. Perhaps the Court of Appeal can take this up one day. <laughs> in conclusion, I'm humbled and honoured to be given the opportunity to oversee the transition of the legal service into the next phase of its evolution. The legal service remains fully committed to discharging the duties and responsibilities that have been entrusted with, with the professionalism and dedication of the legal service officers today, I'm confident that the legal service will meet its goal of becoming the best law firm in Singapore, one where a strong core of quality lawyers supported by the best quality systems and processes produce quality work that upholds and breathes life to the law always serving the interests of Singapore and all Singaporeans. On behalf of the Attorney General's Chambers and the Legal Service, 
I pledge the fullest support to the judiciary in the discharge of your constitutional responsibility to administer justice. May I, also, may I also take this opportunity to congratulate First Chief Justice Nuresh Mandan for his appointment as a member of the International Chamber of Commerce Governing Body for Dispute Resolution Services. I'd like to congratulate Justice Judith Prakash and Justice Tae Yong Kwang on the extension of the appointments as Justices of the Court of Appeal. I would like to congratulate Justice Belinda Ang and Justice Wu Bi Lee on the extension of the appointments as judges of the appellate division. Next, I would like to congratulate Justice Quentin Lowe on the extension of his appointment as judge of the Supreme Court of Fiji. I would like to congratulate Justice Chan Sing On on his appointment as a senior judge of the Supreme Court. I also like to con congratulate Justice Tan Siong Tai on the extension of his appointment as a judge of the High Court. I would like to congratulate Justice Kanan Ramesh on the extension of his appointment as a Judicial Commissioner of the Supreme Court of Brunei Darussalam. I would like to congratulate Justice S. Mohan, Justice Andre Maniam, and Justice Philip Jaratnam on the appointments as judges of the High Court. Also, Justice Andrew Ang and Justice Lai Siu Chu on their reappointment as senior judges. Finally, I would like to congratulate Justice Yuku Miyazaki and Judge Christopher Scott Sonchi on the appointments as international judges of the Singapore International Commercial Court. We also bid farewell to just to, to, to Judicial Commissioner Tan Tui Boon, who had left the batch in March last year. Prior to his term on the Supreme Court bench, he had served with distinction in the, in the Singapore legal service for over 30 years. And I would like to show my appreciation to Tui Boon for his contributions. And finally, I would like to congratulate Mr. Gregory Vijayendran for completing his very successful term as the president of the Law Society, and Mr. Adrian Tan for his election as the next president of the Law Society. As the longest serving Law Society president, Mr. Vijayendra not only helped to navigate the legal industry through the uncertainty brought about by, by, by the COVID pandemic, but he, over, he also oversaw numerous in, initiatives that have helped to strengthen the legal profession. Mr. Vijayendran also took upon himself the task of forging closer ties between the Law Society and AGC. Mr. Tan certainly has big shoes to fill, but I have every confidence that he will thrive in his new role. I will miss working with Mr. Vijayendran as the president of the Law Society. I look forward to working with Mr. Tan as a successor. With this, I wish your honours and all members of the legal community the very best for the year ahead. Mr. Attorney, Mr. Tan. May it please your honour, Chief Justice, Justices of Appeal, Justices and Judicial Commissioners of the Supreme Court, happy 2022. I bid a Singaporean welcome to our bar leaders from Australia, Brunei, China, Hong Kong, Japan, Malaysia, South Korea, and the United Kingdom, and our guests representing the International Bar Association, Commonwealth Lawyers Association, and Law Asia for their virtual presence. This year sees several notable judicial appointments. The President of the Republic of Singapore has extended the appointments of the Justices of the Court of Appeal, Justice Judith Prakash and Justice Taeyong Kwang. And Judges of the Appellate Division, Justice Belinda Ang and Justice Wu Bi Lee. Justice Chan Sing On takes office as Senior Judge of the Supreme Court, while Justice Andrew Ang and Justice Lai Tzu Chu are reappointed Senior Judges. Uh, Justice Tan Siong Tai's appointment as Judge of the High Court has been extended. We welcome new High Court Judges, Justice S. Mohan, Justice Andre Francis Maniam, and Justice Philip Anthony Jeratnam. Uh, two international judges, Justice Yoko Miyazaki of Japan and Justice Christopher Scott 
Son Chi of the United States are appointed to the Singapore International Commercial Court. And we're proud to note that Your Honor, Chief Justice, has been appointed to the ICC Governing Body for Dispute Resolution Services. On behalf of the Law Society, I extend my best wishes to Your Honor and all the nation's judges. We look forward to appearing before all of you. May your hearings be smooth, your witnesses clear, and your counsel interesting and succinct. Last year, I saw the passing of Justice Go Jun Singh. He was a wonderful man, beloved by all. His wisdom, courtesy, and patience shone through as a guiding light for all seekers of justice. Even now, I can see his smiling face and hear his gentle voice. The members of the Law Society will miss him. I also pay tribute to my predecessor, Senior Counsel Gregory Vijendran. He has the distinction of being our longest serving president of the Law Society, having held office for five years. Under his leadership, the Law Society has been transformed. He initiated uh, schemes to aid members, established strong ties with bar associations around the world, and corporatized the Law Society pro bono services as a registered charity. His finest hour came in 2020 when COVID-19 struck. Our members were forced to shutter their offices and provide legal services from their living rooms, balconies, and kitchen tables. Amidst the global uncertainty and confusion, Singapore lawyers soldiered on and continued to serve their clients. Lawyers, in turn, relied on the Law Society to solve problems, invent systems, and coordinate with stakeholders. Throughout the crisis, Gregory's unflappable demeanor gave us confidence that we too could keep calm and carry on. In our battle against the virus, we found in Gregory our wartime president. I served as his treasurer and vice president for four out of those five years, including that fateful year of the circuit breaker. What I learned in that year forms the heart of my speech today, the new Singapore lawyer. I begin by setting the context, our justice system. Our justice system is the pride of our nation. It is widely admired by our global contemporaries. It is simple and reliable. It is a public service that is efficiently run, transparently clean, and trusted by all. It is a vital part of our nation's continued success as a global hub. Now, if you consider the justice system as a giant national app with the citizens at one end and the courts at the other, then lawyers are your user interface, or UI. We act as a means for individuals and businesses to use the system. At the same time, we are the conduit for the courts to handle requests and deliver outcomes to parties. What does it take for a human lawyer to be a UI? There is an easy part, there is a difficult part, and there is an impossible part. The easy part is the law. We spend four years studying the law as an academic subject. It is expertly taught in our universities. A full range of topics are covered. The method of assessment is rigorous, and students emerge with a thorough understanding of legal issues. After years of deep study and arduous examination, they receive their law degrees. To them, I say, you've completed the easy part. The difficult part is practice. Law graduates undergo months of training before they're granted their practicing certificates. Those practicing certificates mean only that they've been exposed to the daily workings of a law firm and haven't made serious errors of judgment during their training. It remains to be seen whether, apart from legal skills, they have the attitude to serve, strength in the face of adversity, and skills needed for practice. They'll need communication skills in dealing with clients. They'll need collaborative skills if they are to work in teams. And they will need business skills because law is a business and because some of their clients will be businesses. And most of all, they'll need resilience because lawyering is draining. In many areas of practice, the lawyer serves as the first responder, where people are threatened 
or businesses or family relationships are fractured, or when commercial opportunities must be seized, they turn to lawyers for help. In turn, lawyers provide counsel on the best way forward, as well as what is possibly more important, a listening ear, a shoulder to lean on, and an encouraging voice. For every lawyer, the early period of their career is a journey of self-discovery. There are those who find lawyering is their calling, that they were born to minister to those in need, that they have patience and empathy to listen and sit with a human being in distress. These sessions often involve spending time dealing with largely irrelevant legal matter. <sighs> Lawyers know that part of the process is establishing trust and uncovering evidence. They distill material that they have heard, filtering out the angst and the heartache, and present only the essence of the issue to the court. Lawyers then receive the court's judgment and process it for their clients. In this manner, lawyers are a two-way filter for the legal system. To the clients, we represent the law. To the law, we represent the clients. We live this duality every day. It's not easy, it's hard. And in recent times, more and more lawyers are finding it impossible to be user interfaces. This brings me to the impossible part of the job. It has to do with sustainability. We are in the midst of the great resignation. Around the world, record numbers are leaving their jobs. In Singapore, a recent survey suggested that nearly a quarter of Singapore workers from all industries are planning to quit in the first half of this year. The Law Society will be carrying out our own studies to understand if the great resignation will disrupt our industry. It is not a large industry. We have only around 6,000 Singapore lawyers, and last year, the profession saw a record number leaving its ranks. Some context, every year, lawyers leave. For the past four years, the number of departures has hovered between 380 to 430 lawyers. But last year, 538 lawyers left practice. That represents an alarming year-on-year -year increase of around 30%. The departures are concentrated among junior lawyers. In our junior category, meaning lawyers in practice for less than five years, we saw a record high of 310 exits making up 14% of junior category lawyers. That coincided with a record low number of new lawyers being called to the bar last year. In summary, the junior category might be facing a perfect storm, a record high number of departures coinciding with a record low number of entrants. The Law Society is concerned. New lawyers rejuvenate the profession, providing the nation with advocates, solicitors, prosecutors, registrars, judicial officers. It's important that after investing so much to train them, we find ways to retain them. It takes years, maybe decades, to be any good at this job. Law requires sustained focus and dedication. Law is not a gig, but a calling. The Law Society will study the attrition rate of young lawyers. There's a sense that if it is not yet a problem, it may eventually become one. A nation grows in tandem with its legal sector. Lawyers support the expansion of business and aid in the resolution of conflict. As our economy is poised to recover and expand, the profession must stand ready to help sustain it. We cannot do so unless we find out why young lawyers are quitting. The obvious question is whether the pandemic is to blame. The truth is that even before 2020, young lawyers were complaining of burnout. It may be tougher to be a young lawyer now than at any other time in history. The hours are long, the clients are demanding. Thanks to technology, young lawyers are on call night and day. Email and instant messaging mean that Young lawyers operate at a far more intense pace compared to previous generations. Many are exhausted. Mental wellness is becoming a concern. 
My guess is that it's always hovered in the background, but young lawyers are brave enough to speak openly about it. In response, the Law Society has introduced over a dozen support schemes. Senior lawyers volunteer to guide lawyers, juniors on law and career opportunities and issues. We provide mentors to focus on the psychological well-being of lawyers. We work with counsellors to counsel them. Yet, those are reactive solutions. They address only the symptom, not the cause of the problem. The lawyers who came of age this millennium are a new breed, distinct from their 20th century predecessors. For one thing, those seniors operated in an era before clients habitually sent them instant messages at all hours of the day and night, expecting a timely yet thoughtful response. Turnaround was slower then. It was a different age. The seniors had a chance to grow into the law at a gentler pace. For another thing, many seniors were prepared to view their legal careers as the central focus of their lives. They expected their relationship with the law to last decades. Many seniors described themselves as being married to the law, forsaking all other distractions. The 21st century lawyers are different. They want to marry not the law, but a human being. They too want to work hard. They too want their work to have meaning, but they also want other things that human beings want. To have children, to build a home, to have a life outside the law. And they may not want to put these aspects of their lives on hold or compromise them in favour of the law. For them, legal practice is a question of sustainability. They feel that there must be a better way to build a sustainable career. There must be a way to cater to the demands of the 21st century client, the 21st century court, and 21st century society, while having a fulfilling family life. Can they have it all? I think there might be a solution. It could begin with a bit of magic by making the law firm vanish. To explain this, I invite you to travel back in time with me, 24 months ago. I was unfamiliar with these terms. 24 months ago, uh, QR code, social distancing, Zoom, mRNA. When the pandemic hit, Singapore went into lockdown. Law firms were shuttered. Lawyers found themselves advising their clients through webcams, and mobile phones, while children and small animals scampered in the background. We were introduced to another term, WFH, or work from home. At first, there was consternation all around. Lawyer chat groups were filled with questions. How would we complete conveyancing transactions? What would happen to hearings? How would we conduct privileged discussions? Very quickly, though, we realized that this was a breakthrough moment as we adjusted to the idea of conferencing through a laptop or making court applications through a webcam, we began to grasp what it meant to be a 21st century lawyer. We understood that not every law firm needed a reception area or permanent meeting rooms. We learned that commissioning affidavits could be done online. We, we discovered that court applications, appeals, and even trials could be carried out virtually. We figured out ways to cross-examine a witness a thousand miles away. A conservative, tradition-bound profession found that you can indeed teach an old advocate new tricks. Lawyers encountered another new phenomenon, family time. We could see family members in the daylight and dine with them on weekdays. We found regular an abundant family life, unfamiliar, yet rewarding. So as our offices sat empty and idle, we found ourselves asking, will this be permanent? Can the next generation of lawyers choose to be remote workers? If so, will all law firms still need large offices? Might some lawyers dispense with the 21st century concepts of daily commuting, nine to five, and working for the landlord? We polled our members. 70% of respondents 
told us that law practice should be permitted to deliver legal services entirely online without a physical office. Over 80% thought that rules should be reviewed to allow for innovative ways to deliver legal services. And it wasn't just the young lawyers telling us this. It was lawyers of all seniority levels, from all sizes of law firms. They sent a clear signal to us to explore ways for lawyers to serve the public by harnessing technology and refreshing ideas on what a law practice in the 21st century ought to be. Traditional law firms will no doubt continue to occupy a major role with brick-and-mortar offices and blue-ribbon service for blue-chip clients. They will play to establish strengths with teams of partners and associates working from city offices to provide sophisticated and complex legal services to their client base of financial institutions, multinational corporations and governments. But our members also asked, might a new type of law firm and lawyering emerge too? Can law firms providing affordable legal services to individuals and small businesses and medium enterprises be leaner? Can those practices go online Providing cheaper and more accessible legal services, could some law firms disappear completely from the real world and reappear in the virtual one? The more we thought about this question, the more we began to think, why not? And the clearer the future of lawyering became to us. This is the picture I present to you of the new Singapore lawyer works from a laptop, uses technology to collaborate with other lawyers, meets clients virtually, and is not bound to a physical office. Whenever there's a need for sensitive communication, the new Singapore lawyer will book a secure Zoom pod. If there's a month-long arbitration with opponents in different time zones, the new Singapore lawyer will use special facilities to cater to those needs. Put another way, the new Singapore lawyer will spend more time on work rather than on commuting to work. In working from home, the new Singapore lawyer may require a different leadership style, where self-startership and initiative take center stage. Law firm culture may be less top-down and more grassroots, as juniors are trusted and empowered to carry out tasks and pursue ideas with light supervision. There may not be a standard partner track for all, some lawyers may opt to work on a project basis, while others may work with allied professionals. This may be in line with Chief Justice's prediction of an emergence of legal practices adopting the rocket structure outside the confines of a traditional law firm. The, the point really is that the profession is at an inflection point. Questions about what lawyers do and what law firms will look like are fair game. And senior lawyers may not have all the answers. As always, whenever senior lawyers are stumped, they look to juniors to provide the answers. So it's no different this time. We will give young lawyers the space to lead and show us who the new Singapore lawyer will be and what the modern invisible law firm might look like. And in addressing the needs of the new Singapore lawyer, we shall be improving the lot of all lawyers by inspiring a rethink of what it means to practice. By averting a great resignation, we may spark a great revival in the profession. Of course, change can be daunting. To every new idea, we can be confident people will say three things. It's difficult, it's never been done, and there will be problems. Let's agree with all those statements and get them out of the way. And let's add three. It is worthwhile, it can be done, and we will be the first. Already, the Law Society has started laying the groundwork for this transformation. We initiated a four-month-long acceleration program supported by the Ministry of Law and Enterprise Singapore called Raising the Bar. It helps small and medium-sized law firms innovate and transform their businesses to stay relevant and competitive in this digital-first world. The aim is to spark innovation and reinvention in Singapore firms 
so that they are ready for the future. We might see a future where traditional and virtual law firms compete for legal talent based on not just salary, but the availability of hybrid arrangements and varied career paths. The Law Society will conduct conversations with stakeholders to understand the implications of virtual law firms. What transactions can be carried out virtually? How can new lawyers be mentored? How can we use technology to allow them to collaborate and learn through observation? How can best practices be inculcated if young lawyers do not work under the direct in-person supervision of their seniors? Can we still build a collegiate spirit if we do not meet each other in the corridors of the courts? These are fair questions. It cannot be beyond our collective ingenuity to find answers. COVID has taught us we could imagine a different world and build it fast. Thanks to the havoc that this virus has wrought and the way we have recovered, we are now confident that we are resourceful and resilient enough to adapt. We've realized that this image we had of ourselves as dinosaurs holding fast to the comforts of yesterday is a false one. That is not who we are. We are a nimble, hungry profession. We are willing to compete and evolve. If our industry needs to be re-engineered, we lawyers will lead the way. We will not be held back by a lack of ambition, willpower, or imagination. I've reached a part of my speech entitled The Law Society's Sporting Successes Against the Attorney General's Chambers. The pandemic has prevented us from securing our usual victories on the football pitch and handball court against the noble athletes of the Chambers. But this year, in line with the themes of my speech and in the spirit of new ideas and the use of technology, I'd like to challenge the Chambers in the arena of e-sports. We will not allow a tiny virus to interrupt the long-standing tradition of sporting rivalry between the Law Society and the Chambers. This brings me to the final part of my speech, service to the community. Whether we're talking about young Singapore lawyers or old ones, there is one thing we have in common, belief in the curative powers of the law. We consider that the law and legal system offer a means of addressing many of society's conflicts and ills, that is why lawyers as a breed are drawn towards using law to help others. We lawyers invented the term pro bono and we pledge to keep the pro bono spirit alive and burning brightly in our community. The members of the Law Society are dedicated to the ideals of the nation, the rule of law and the need for access to justice. To that end, our members organized and participated in numerous pro bono schemes to aid Singaporeans. For example, our family practice committee introduced schemes that afforded affordable mediation and mutual evaluation for divorces. We've also assisted the Ministry of Law in providing low-cost mediation in relation to its COVID-19 relief schemes. In all these initiatives, we strive to show the public the reality that the lawyer is a peacemaker we resolve conflicts and end disputes. The Law Society will continue to offer pro bono services. It will also spread law awareness and promote legal literacy. We believe citizens must be educated on what the law has to offer. They should understand how the legal system works to protect their interests and safeguard society. To this end, the Law Society will become an influencer. We will use the levers of social media to explain legal concepts to Singaporeans and how the law relates to their lives. We will feature our lawyers in videos. We will use LinkedIn and other platforms to discuss legal developments, the role of lawyers and the work of the law society. We will push back on legal misinformation because we understand that fake news undermines our system. We will demystify law to empower citizens. In conclusion, uh, to the Attorney General's Chambers, I reaffirm the Law Society's continued commitment to sustaining efficient and effective administration of justice. 
to your honour and your colleagues on the bench, our members pledge to do their duty to assist the court with diligence and integrity for the betterment of Singapore. May I extend to your honour, Chief Justice, all members of the Judiciary, the, ministry, the Minister for Law and Attorney General, the bar's best wishes for good health, wisdom and fortitude in the year ahead. May I also ask you to look out for a new type of lawyer and the emergence of a new type of law firm in the coming years. You may also see more of the Law Society in your social media feeds, on your mobile phones and in your tablets. The profession has weathered the COVID storm and is ready to emerge stronger with renewed energy and a vision for the future. May it please the court. Thank you. Mr. Attorney, Mr. Tan, honoured guests, members of the bar, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the judiciary, I welcome you to the opening of this legal year. I'm grateful to all of you, including our friends and colleagues from abroad, especially the Right Honourable Tun Tunku Maimun Binti Tuan Mat, Chief Justice of Malaysia, and the Honourable Chief Justice Alexander G. Jasmundo of the Supreme Court of the Philippines for having taken the time to join us this morning. For the second time in our history, we open the legal year using a remote conferencing platform. This is a sign of the times, but as difficult as the past two years have been, I'm confident that when we look back on all that has happened one day, we shall especially recall the remarkable spirit of collaboration that made possible what seemed impossibly daunting at times. The Attorney General's Chambers, the Bar, and the Judiciary have worked together tirelessly over the past two years with the support of the Ministry of Law to meet the many challenges posed by the pandemic in order to keep the engine of justice running smoothly. For this, I thank you both, Mr. Attorney, Mr. Tan, and the institutions you each represent, and the Ministry of Law. Before I turn to address the rapidly changing environment that confronts us all, let me briefly recount the changes affecting the senior ranks of the profession since the opening of the last legal year. First, Justices Mavis Chion, S. Mohan, Andre Maniam, and Philip Jaratnam were appointed judges of the High Court. We also retain the expertise of eight of our Supreme Court judges who have had their tenures extended. Although Justice Chan Seng On has retired as a judge of the High Court, I'm pleased that he will continue to serve as a senior judge of the Supreme Court. I also thank Mr. Tan Pui Boon, whose term as a Judicial Commissioner ended in March last year. In the course of a long career in the legal service, he made many contributions to the judiciary, notably in the area of family justice. Second, the Singapore International Commercial Court bench will be further strengthened with the addition of two eminent international judges. Justice Yuko Miyazaki, whose term commenced on 5th January 2022, and Justice Christopher Scott Sanchi, whose term will commence on 4th July this year. Justice Miyazaki previously served as a Justice of the Supreme Court of Japan, while Justice Sanchi was, until recently, the Chief Judge of the United States Bankruptcy Court for the District of Delaware. I extend my heartiest congratulations to my colleagues on their respective appointments and extensions. They each make an invaluable contribution to the extraordinary breadth, diversity, and strength of our bench. As you have observed, Mr. Tan, last year also marked the passing of Mr. Gojun Singh. I had the pleasure of appearing before him as an advocate. His was a warm and worthy face of justice. Wise, patient, empathetic, kind, and yet firm. We are privileged to have had him grace our bench and shall miss him greatly. I also congratulate you, Mr. Tan, on your election as president of the Law Society. You succeed Mr. Vijayendran, who holds the distinction of being the Law Society's longest serving president. During his five-year term, Mr. Vijayendran undoubtedly helped further strengthen 
the constructive relationship between the bench and the bar. Mr. Tan, you described Mr. Vijayendran as the society's wartime president. There is no doubt that his willingness to work closely with all stakeholders to navigate uncharted territory at many points over the last two years has been extremely helpful. With his long background in social service, Mr. Vijendran's term as president was inevitably marked by a deep and growing consciousness of the Law Society's responsibility to the wider community. I fully expect that this will continue. I extend the bench's deepest appreciation to Mr. Vijayendran for the service he has rendered to the profession, and we wish you, Mr. Tan, all the best as you take the helm from him. Let me next mention just three of the major developments over the course of the past year. First, as part of our continuing quest to refine our justice system, the Appellate Division of the High Court commenced operations on 2nd January last year under the charge of Justice Belinda Ung. Since then, the Appellate Division has heard and decided many matters and now carries a substantial caseload. This in turn is helping to relieve some of the load carried by the Court of Appeal. We also saw the passage of the Court's Civil and Criminal Justice Reform Act 2021. <laughs> Among other things, the Act empowers us to conduct proceedings asynchronously without oral arguments and to require the parties to attempt amicable resolution in appropriate circumstances. The Act reflects a very important step towards the transformation of our justice system and towards enhancing access to justice. At the same time, the new rules of court 2021 and the new SICC rules have been gazetted and will be brought into effect on 1st April 2022. I will say more on these shortly. Second, we have continued to engage significantly with our foreign counterparts. This has culminated in various past and forthcoming engagements, including the following. We successfully hosted the third meeting of the Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts last March, bringing together more than 30 commercial courts from around the world. For the first time, the meeting had to be hosted on a virtual platform, but it was nonetheless very well received. The Standing International Forum continues to grow from strength to strength as it strives to advance dialogue, and thought leadership among commercial courts in developing and implementing best practices for transnational commercial litigation. Towards the end of last year, we participated in the fifth Singapore-China Legal and Judicial Roundtable, at which we signed the Memorandum of Understanding on Cooperation on Information on Foreign Law with the Supreme People Court, People's Court of the People's Republic of China. This establishes a mechanism for referring questions of foreign law between the two courts in civil and commercial cases. This is the first such instrument that the SPC has concluded, reflecting the depth and strength of our mutual engagement. In keeping with this, we also renewed our shared commitment to promote and advance cooperation in judicial education, and we continue to work together to develop a legal infrastructure for the resolution of transnational commercial disputes arising out of the Belt and Road Initiative. We enjoy an especially close relationship with our Malaysian counterparts have, have been working on several significant initiatives with them. Last year, we implemented two sets of protocols to facilitate communication and cooperation with the Federal Court of Malaysia in proceedings concerning admiralty and cross-border corporate insolvency matters. This year, we will host the seventh Judicial Seminar on Commercial Litigation in February. The seminar is convened by the judiciaries of Hong Kong, New South Wales, and Singapore, and we will be joined this year by representatives from nine other invited courts. 
We also established the International Judicial Dispute Resolution Network, and later this year will host its inaugural meeting. This is a network of judiciaries which share the common objective of promoting the early, amicable, and fair resolution of court disputes without trial through the use of judge-led dispute resolution tools as a core case management strategy. These tools include judicial mediation, early neutral evaluation, and judge-directed negotiations. And in addition to these engagements, we established and deepened our links with the Supreme Courts of the Republic of Korea and of Rwanda. At the same time, through the state courts, we continue to play a leading role in the International Consortium for Court Excellence, which we co-founded some years ago. Finally, numerous significant initiatives were realized through the collaborative efforts of the AGC, the Bar, and the Judiciary over the past year. The new rules of court 2021 and the new SICC rules are major examples to which I will turn, but there are others of which I mention updating the costs guidelines with the benefit of feedback from more than 60 law firms. Let me turn next to major developments on the horizon, which fall into three broad categories. The first is the coming into force of our new civil procedural rules. The new rules of court 2021 and the new SICC rules are the product of blue sky thinking informed by international best practices. They reflect our earnest desire to modernize the civil justice landscape. The new rules of court 2021 have had a long period of gestation that also incorporated a public consultation exercise. They reflect the labors of a great many people. I want to express my heartfelt appreciation to each of them. There are too many to name individually, but I must at least express my deep gratitude to my colleagues, Justices Te Yong Kwang, Chua Li Meng, and Ang Cheng Hock who amongst them have generously led the work of the Civil Justice Commission from inception to implementation and were most ably supported by the registry. The rules are guided by five worthwhile ideals, namely fair access to justice, expeditious proceedings, cost-effective and proportionate processes, efficient use of court resources, and fair and practical results suited to the needs of the parties. While the new rules are largely aligned with the draft that was released for public consultation in October 2018, we also recognize that practitioners will benefit from having some time to get acquainted with the finer details. And so when we published the rules on 1st December 2021, we acceded to the Law Society's request and deferred the effective commencement to 1st April 2022. In addition, there will be a transitional learning phase from 1st April to 30th June 2022. During this period, the courts will generally be more sympathetic when dealing with non-compliance occasioned by a genuine lack of familiarity with the new procedural framework and will, in deserving cases, afford greater leeway when considering the appropriate orders to be made in the face of such non-compliance, the exercise of discretion in striking out matters or making unless orders or granting requests for refunds and waivers of filing fees, and granting extensions of time to file an appeal or to apply for permission to appeal, or generally in dealing with incorrect appellate filings. We must all approach the transitional learning phase in the spirit in which this is intended and do our best to understand, comply with, and implement the new rules so that together we may achieve the ideals that animate them. When the new rules become effective, we will also usher in the new SICC rules. These standard-setting and customized rules draw from international best practices 
and are driven by some key principles. The expeditious and efficient administration of justice according to law, procedural flexibility, and fair, impartial, and practical processes and procedures compatible with and responsive to the needs and realities of international commerce. They also build on existing innovative practices of the SICC, such as the additional case management features for matters placed on the Technology Infrastructure and Construction, or TIC, list which are designed for the effective and efficient resolution of technically complex disputes. The SICC rules and the TIC list and protocols are the fruits of the joint efforts of several of our Singapore and international judges, and I am deeply grateful to all of them. These initiatives will enhance the SICC status as a leading commercial court and in turn, Singapore's standing as a major center for legal services. The second set of major developments relates to innovations to support the profession and others seeking to access legal resources and tools. I highlight three of these. First, the new LawNet will be launched this year. This will serve as a single digital hub to access all of the content and services provided by the Singapore Academy of Law. Users will continue to be able to access LawNet to conduct legal research on content such as case law. In addition, the material that may be researched through the platform will be expanded to include Asian content. To further support practitioners, users will also be able to subscribe to a digital library on LawNet containing all Academy publishing books under the Law Practice Series, the Law Practice Casebook Series, and the Monograph Series. Second, the Singapore Mediation Center expects to launch an online dispute resolution service towards the end of the first quarter of this year. This will also be accessible to the public and it promises to reduce the cost of resolving lower value cases, such as consumer disputes by using technology and automation. Third, we expect to finalize the data and digital economy specialist accreditation scheme in the second quarter of this year. Along with the two existing schemes for specialist accreditation, namely building and construction and shipping and maritime law, this will expand the opportunities for lawyers to advance their professional competence and standing and provide users of such services with some indication of special experience. These are important aspects of the SAL's efforts to support the profession in its digital transformation journey. But more can and should be done to maximize the potential for the SAL to support us as we venture into the future. The Senate has therefore decided that the SAL will, in the coming year, establish a wholly owned subsidiary. This will be led by a separate board that will be well equipped to oversee and steer the development of bold and innovative products and services that more fully harness technologies and knowledge management and legal analytics. The third major development is the imminent restructuring of the existing legal service into the reconstituted Singapore Legal Service and the dedicated Singapore Judicial Service with effect from this Friday, 14th January, 2022. Mr. Attorney, you have rightly devoted much of your address this morning to what this means for the legal service. Like you, I cherish and value the outstanding ability of the officers we have been able to attract, retain, and develop over the years. And that is as it should be. The work of advising the government and representing the state in all legal matters, and of administering justice through the fair and impartial adjudication of disputes, are two of the most basic indispensable foundations for the rule of law. This did not happen fortuitously, but is the result of careful planning and intentional 
human capital development efforts on the part of the Legal Service Commission since its inception in 1959. And indeed, as you have noted, we owe a debt of gratitude to all those who have served as Commission members and staff. It is unsurprising then that the possibility of such a restructuring is something that the Commission has considered from time to time, given the growing complexity of legal work and the concomitant need for specialization. Indeed, as you have observed, Mr. Attorney, this led to the establishment in 2014 of separate legal and judicial career tracks for legal, services officer, for legal service officers in the middle ranks. The existing personnel boards were then restructured with separate boards overseeing each branch within an overall structure that remained integrated. The restructuring that will shortly take effect will advance this to the next level, and it will enhance the ability of each service to provide specialist training and development. For those in the judiciary, this presents the opportunity to go beyond the adjudication of disputes and embrace the vision of being a part of the national institution entrusted with the administration of justice. This will involve work along several distinct facets, of which I mentioned three. The first is to enhance, deepen, and broaden the judicial skill set. Our judges and judicial service officers must acquire and develop the highest level of forensic skills. In a world of ever-increasing complexity, law and the administration of justice are affected by that same trend. The enhancement of forensic skills will inevitably demand the ability to deal effectively with ever more complex and technical expert evidence given trends such as the scientization of proof. Because lawyers of the future will be flanked by allied legal professionals trained in complementary fields, as I suggested two years ago, and as you, Mr. Tan, have just alluded to, our judges, too, will need some familiarity with related fields of knowledge, such as psychiatry, statistics, financial accounting, technology, public policy, and criminology. Some of this will entail formal academic training. Some will come from suitable professional exposure. And so it will be essential for us to plan a career path for our judicial service officers, some of whom will be younger than we have generally been accustomed to, to ensure that they get the necessary skills and expertise. The second is to integrate within the judicial mindset the critical importance of securing and enhancing access to justice. Every judge must be exercised by the need to overcome the many barriers that persist in the way of accessing justice, if necessary, through the adoption of innovative measures. Let me outline some examples of things we have already done or are working on. We have developed an outcome simulator that will provide those involved in motor accident cases with information, such as possible liability findings and awards for different types of personal injuries. This is to help the parties, especially those without representation, make assessments of their positions even before engaging lawyers. In very much the same vein, we launched the Divorce e-Service last year. This is an online portal that will assist litigants in person with preparing and filing court papers in uncontested divorce applications. A similar portal is being developed for certain probate applications. We created the SG Courts app, which is available without charge to e-litigation subscribers. The app is being enhanced on a continuing basis to add features and to respond to user feedback. The aim is to simplify various aspects of the litigation journey from gaining access to the case file taking queue numbers for hearings, and even attending hearings remotely. 
We will also strive to help court users better understand and navigate court processes using materials such as the digests and the primer video on the new rules of court 2021 and the updated guidebook for accused in person. The Family Justice Courts will also look into providing case summaries of important precedents to assist the many litigants who conduct their own cases in this area. And we will continue to harness the energy and enthusiasm of law students who, under the supervision of qualified lawyers, can assist those not eligible for criminal legal aid prepare their mitigation pleas. We can expect more such efforts all directed at bringing justice closer to those who seek it. Third, we should, wherever appropriate, develop bespoke models of justice, having regard to the contours of different classes of dispute, including their size, nature, complexity, and the types of interests at play. I can illustrate this with two examples. First, family justice. We have long recognized that family justice calls for a very different approach than the traditional adversarial model. Simply put, a zero-sum win-loss approach is unsuitable and ultimately destructive when it comes to dealing with familial relations that are already distressed. Our approach to family justice have, has evolved over the years. Last year, we took the very important step of implementing the therapeutic justice model. We will continue to build on this with initiatives like docketing selected high-conflict divorce cases to multidisciplinary teams comprising a hearing judge, a judge mediator, a case manager, and other specialists working together to facilitate a positive and durable outcome. Establishing a, pan, a standing panel of financial experts following the successful pilot that was conducted last year so that neutral experts may be appointed to assist the court and the parties with financial planning, division of matrimonial assets, and maintenance. And piloting a panel of therapeutic specialists comprising qualified mental health and social science professionals to provide specialized clinical and therapeutic services to support families in need. This was first announced in September last year, and a memorandum of understanding was signed with the Associated Professional Associations last Wednesday. Another area that calls for careful attention concerns what may be called hyper-complex disputes. These are technically complex in subject matter, and evidentially complex by virtue of the volume of evidence involved. We will inevitably see more of these disputes. They can be very difficult to grapple with and place a real strain on our legal and adjudicative resources. To optimally manage such disputes, we must re-examine some of the long-held assumptions underlying our adjudicative approaches and consider alternative strategies that can help contain and downsize disputes. We have taken some initial steps with the SICC's TIC list, which aims to downsize complex disputes through the two voluntary protocols that I alluded to earlier. The first streamlines the resolution of smaller value claims in cases containing many distinct claims, while the second encourages the frank and early exchange of information between the parties. The three facets that I have outlined are complex and intertwined and reflect the sorts of issues that, that the judiciary will have to contend with in the coming years. The establishment of the judicial service will help us meet them in a considered and intentional way with carefully customized policies and practices to train and develop our human capital. A key focus will be to ensure that we can secure a strong pipeline of talent within the judicial service. This will entail bringing in suitable officers at all levels of seniority, as well as providing the necessary training, development, and resources 
to ensure that they find meaning and satisfaction in the course of their judicial careers. To this end, one of the most important developments will be to significantly expand the role and the capacity of the Singapore Judicial College. A team led by Justice Philip Jayaratnam and Judicial Commissioner Kwek Min Luck, who together bring extensive senior experience in the private and public legal sectors, will look specifically into developing a world-class program for the college. The training effort will be accompanied by structuring a planned career path for judicial service officers that will equip them for this work. This might comprise an initial period of broad-based training within the courts, likely with, the, with some external attachments and be followed by a subsequent period of more specialized vocational training and mentoring. We will concurrently enhance our efforts to professionalize our court administrators who play a vital role in supporting the judiciary. As a step in this direction, we convened the inaugural conference of our court administrators last December to afford them a platform to exchange best practices across all our courts and to provide training in digital skills. In common with all judicial officers, our court administrators are also supported by the Learn at Judiciary training program. And we are strengthening our supporting infrastructure by developing our knowledge management and corporate communications functions. I very much look forward to the next phase of our journey. There is certainly much to do. Indeed, the realization of our vision for the judiciary will surely be among our most significant projects in the coming years. I have formed a core team to assist me in planning and implementing the systemic changes that will be required, and I'm greatly assured in the knowledge that I shall have the counsel, support, and assistance of an outstanding team of commission members comprising a mix of judges and other experienced professionals. We will keep the profession informed of these developments as they take shape and will continue to consult our stakeholders at suitable points in the process. I have reached the point where I announce the appointment of senior counsel. The selection committee has decided this year to appoint Mr. Tan Pui Boon following the completion of his term as judicial commissioner as Senior Counsel Honoris Causa, and Ms. Marina, Marina Chin Li Yuan and Ms. Ko Sui Yen as Senior Counsel. I congratulate them and look forward to their continued contributions to the profession. The profession and our justice system are in a time of transition. The Law Society will be led by a new president, and as the separate judicial and legal services come into being, they will each undertake important initiatives to meet the challenges that lie ahead. I'm confident that in all this, we will continue working together to further strengthen our justice system by moving in the same collaborative spirit that has long served us well. Thank you all very much once again for your presence this morning. On behalf of the judiciary, I wish all of you a happy, healthy, and fulfilling new year. The court is adjourned. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the opening of the legal year 2022 ceremony. Thank you for joining us today. Stay safe and keep well. <laughs>